Thanks for joining everyone. I'm Mark Pendergrass and welcome to one in a series of Norton Expert interviews. In a typical year, we would have the chance to sit down with you, our customers, as well as our industry partners at IMTS and have a, have a discussion on what's going on in the marketplace and, and industry trends and those kinds of things. So we all know that the year is a little bit different. So we're taking it virtually this year and bringing in all of these experts that we have talking about uh, different markets and, and the products that go within them. But before we get into the discussion of cutting tool, let's talk. Uh, let's hand it over to uh, Jamie, and uh, she'll have a quick introduction of our of our panel. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, really interested to hear a little bit more about what you have to say about the cutting tool industry. Um, so obviously, we have our, our Norton experts here. We have representatives from our product management and product engineering team, as well as our application engineers that are focused on the cutting tool market. Um, so I'll quickly introduce everyone so we, have, we know who, um, who's joining us this, this afternoon. Um, from product management, we have John Gillespie and Matt Jacob. And from our ac application engineering team, we have Takwa Galani and Alfredo Berrigan. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I'll pass it back to Mark. Thanks, Jamie. All right, now that we have our introductions out of the way, let's get started into the details. So, Alfredo, if you don't mind, let's start with you and share some of the key trends in the cutting tools market and overall health of the industry, if you don't mind. Sure. So, first of all, thank you for having us, Jamie and Mark. Hello, everyone. So, in regards to the current cutting tool market conditions worldwide, uh, we still foresee a favorable uptrend growth, as one shown over the last years. So, in terms in value, it is estimated this market to register an annual growth of 6% reaching up to $26 billion by 2026. Uh, I think it is worth to mention that cutting tool technologies have often been and will be essential to the progress of most industries, such as automotive, aerospace and defense, oil and gas, power generation, and others. Uh, another health indicator about this market's performance is that it keeps to be perfectly competitive. Uh, what I mean with this is that the sum of the market share percentage held by the largest number of firms, for example, the Sandvigs, Canameros, Iskars, Kyocera, the big players out there, is less than 50%. So this means that there are a lot of players and a lot of opportunities in this market, which is a really good thing. So in terms of how this market is segmented today, we can split it in the following categories. You have tool type, material type, industries, and regions. To begin with, we have tool type. So the cutting tool industry as a whole is divided into two main tool type families. You have the solid round tools and the inserts. Mm -hmm. Here, the round tools have dominated the market over the years with a share of more than 60%, which is huge and outstanding. Now, jumping to material type, we have tungsten carbide and high-speed steel as the top two. However, it's really followed closely by ceramics, stainless steel, PCD, PCBN, and other exotic materials. Here, carbide has dominated the market with an estimated share of around 45% in 2019, and it's still projected to exceed the highest annual growth rate of around 8% to 2026. We go by industry or application, we still find automotive leading the pack, trailed closely by aerospace and defense, oil and gas, power generation, uh, construction, electronics, and others. Here, the automotive industry has dominated the market of the last decades with a share of 26% last year. Due to current worldwide conditions, this may change, but however, it's still expected for automotive to keep leading for the next following years. Uh, last but not least, we segment the market by region. Last year, Asia Pacific dominated the cutting tool market with around 40% of the total market share, followed by the Americas with only 30%. This region, Asia Pacific, as we know, is home to one of the largest manufacturing industries for machine tools, automotive, electronics, so basically almost everything globally. So hence, the region is still expected to witness the highest uh, annual growth rate of around 8% and retain the leading position in the global market for the next seven years. So in a nutshell, I can tell and I have seen that the cutting tool market industry is healthy and favorable for the next years. Takwa, if you would please share with our audience how Norton fits into the cutting tool industry and manufacturing side of things. Sure, Mark. So at Norton, we make all kinds of abrasive products. In cutting tool market, we make products for grinding wheels, for 
um, for OD, for gashing, for fluting, for inserts. So basically anything and every product that you need for grinding cutting tools, we can supply that for you. If you don't mind sharing your thoughts on how COVID is impacting the cutting tool industry with its customers. Thank you, Mark. So the cutting tool market was affected by COVID as expected, just like every other industry was. The two largest users of cutting tools are automotive and aerospace, and they stopped producing for many weeks, which had a direct impact on cutting tool market. Well, as Alfredo mentioned, in 2019, Asia Pacific dominated the cutting tool market with 38.8% market share. For a long time, most of the manufacturing plants were completely shut down in Asia, and that impacted the sales of cutting tools significantly. And in addition to that, we had some decrease of raw materials due to COVID as well, which affected manufacturing of cutting tools, which, which led to decline to revenues. But <laughs> there's always light at the end of the tunnel. So we're seeing the lockdown being lifted. And as we see that happening, an uptick in sales of cutting tools is happening. Um, as people are getting more comfortable with flying, aerospace industry is producing more, which has a direct impact on cutting tool. I, for one, definitely want to start flying pretty soon, and I think I'm pretty comfortable with that. Um, so that is going to be a big producer, and that's going to impact the production significantly in cutting tool market. There were a lot of positive uh, aspects of the slowdown. Um, it's always great to see how much we can do when we're, we have, we're in challenging times. And one thing we did during this was work with our customers in improving their processes. A lot of our customers reached out to us asking for better products, um, helping them optimize the products they have right now. As we all know in manufacturing, preventative maintenance is kind of a difficult task. But these days, uh, a lot of people are investing a lot in PMing their machines, which helps in turn get better products on the machine, better grinding wheels on the machine because they're improving the rigidity of the system as a whole. Um, I would want our product manager and product engineer, John and Matt, to discuss a little bit more about our products that we've been testing and our future products that are uh, gonna be released. Thanks, Taco. That's a great transition. Um, let's jump over to John and talk a little bit more about um, some of the products that we have that are geared towards this specific market, towards cutting tools. That these are these are your super abrasive products, right, John? Absolutely. And I'm just going to build on what Alfredo and Takwa said. I I've been involved in this market from a lot for a long time, and seen the evolution of the manufacture of cutting tools from manual machines to single use automated machines to many axis CNC machines. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, the challenge from the product side is to keep up with the uh, the product that's required to support the um, requirements of these new machines. Uh, from going to you know multi operational machines on the CNC, they can they can flute, they can gash, they can relieve all in one chucking of the tool, etc. Um, and then the exotic materials, the ceramics, et cetera. So you need new formulations and recipes to do that. So we, uh, we've had polyamide wheels, phenolic wheels, all resin for a while. Then we went with the uh, G-Force wheel, we called the hybrid for several years, which, which moved the bar quite a bit for cycle times. Uh, suddenly cycle time reduction uh, became very important uh, you, when you're tying up a very expensive machine. And uh, most recently, we've had our Paradigm product, which is, uh, has all the good qualities of a um, vitrified wheel with the porosity and its dressability, um, but the uh, durability of a polyimid or a resin wheel. So it's always a challenge as the cutting tool manufacturers and the machine builders advance their, their technology, we have to have the product that will support that appropriately. And sometimes we even think we'd like to push the, them a little bit to build, uh, to move the bar to keep up with our products. Um, John, can you elaborate a little bit more on the difference um, in a paradigm wheel for um, a round tool versus an insert? Certainly. Um, as far as the wheel itself, the geometry is very different. 
Uh, round tool manufacturing, you're usually using the OD or a point on the OD of the wheel. Um, to make a round tool, the various operations, fluting, gashing, pointing, relieving, et cetera. For inserts, there's basically two operations where you top and bottom grind the insert and then you periphery grind. So the wheel, so usually uh, flat wheels with the abrasive located on the side of the wheel with a reciprocating motion either across the top and bottom. It could also be a planetary motion for top and bottom. Uh, and if you're grinding in the periphery, it's a recip, and there's, there's several geometry features that can be done with a uh, in an insert grind on the specific machines. And I, I hear a rumor that we might be introducing a new version of Paradigm that's a little bit lighter weight. Absolutely. Um, one of the one of the drawbacks with Paradigm, especially if you have three wheels on a spindle and they were all on a steel core. Um, it gets heavy on the end of that spindle. It draws a lot of horsepower and it, it actually weighs on the spindle, it hurts the bearings, etc. So, um, and some of these wheels get fairly beefy if they're up around an inch thick or so. That's a, that's a big piece of steel to hang on, on an arbor. So, we've been working on it for a few years. We've got some, some product out there for about two years now that we call Paradigm Lightweight. Um, it takes about 40% of the weight out of the wheel, possibly more depending on the configuration. And you, you can see it right away on the, the spindle load, it goes way down, especially if you have more than one paradigm wheel on the spindle. Um, so that allows more horsepower from the machine to do the work rather than just to spin the wheel. So it's, it's a definite advantage there. Uh, We've been told, we haven't been able to quantify it, that the finish looks better because it produces less vibration. Uh, the other thing that the lightweight core does for us is that the fact that most cutting tools are manufactured using oil as the coolant, and occasionally the delivery of the oil isn't as pure as it should be. There might be a little mist or whatever. Uh, if a carbide tool or another material tool happens to touch the steel core on the paradigm wheel is the possibility of making sparks. So if you have misty oil and sparks, you essentially have a combustion, which uh, nobody likes that. Those uh, are what, we, what we don't like to do is test the prior, the fire suppression systems on the machines. <laughs> uh, I've seen it a few times, it's not pleasant. So uh, the lightweight cores will not be steel. They not, will not create sparks. And uh, if, if there's some sort of collision that happens unintentionally, it's, it's taking the danger out. So the advantages are um, more horsepower available to grind, which means you can grind faster, and there's the safety factor. Excellent. Um, and Matt, I want to ask you about another new product that we're launching, um, V Prime. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that one? And and actually, how does it compare with Paradigm? Where does it fit in in our in the overall Norton portfolio of cutting tool um, wheels? Absolutely. So, V Prime is a resin bond product, but it's a higher performance resin bond relative to what our standard resin bonds are, and the pricing is competitive in that way. So. Paradigm is typically not capable of being made into cup shapes, 11 and 12 V9 shapes, whereas V prime fits in there very, very well. Uh, so there are some small limitations with Paradigm as far as shapes go that, par that the V prime doesn't have. We can make V prime in, in those cups and use them for end, end relief, OD relief, that sort of thing. And that does that's where it seems to really shine for us. We've seen more more success there than we have anywhere else at the moment. Mm -hmm. But we're really starting to get into applying this to more applications in the country and, and see how it goes. Great. And Alfredo, actually, will you be able to, can you comment a little bit on um, what type of dressing products we typically use with um, with the with the Paradigm and or V Prime product? Almost well, definitely, and that's a really good point that John was, uh, he just explained one of the beauties about Paradigm is that really easy to do online. So this is specially focused to mass production customers. So for customers that are looking for that lights out manufacturing while they have the state of the art equipment, the grinder, proper coolant delivery, and all the best wheel out there, which is Paradigm in this case, 
you can definitely use a CNC diamond disc. And now the latest is that we have been reinforcing these discs with CVD ingots. So that makes the CVD disc to last longer. And again, paradigm doesn't require a lot of dressing. Really easy to true, really easy to dress. So the customer can feel okay. He can have that light side manufacturing that it's basically just click and play to the program and just let it run for high production orders. So it's a really good thing. It's something where the customers uh, are pushing for to have that light side manufacturing capability where they can run several hundreds or whatever the number of parts in one truing operation. Excellent. Um, so do we want to switch gears here and talk a little bit more about um, future trends and what we see you know, in the future for the cutting tool industry? Sure, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So as we know, we're in the fourth industrial revolution right now. So uh, Industry 4.0 is pretty popular amongst all manufacturing and cutting tool market is specially uh, adopting it. So one of the largest cutting tool manufacturing company has publicly announced that they'll be implementing an Industry 4.0 system across all their facilities. So at Single Bay and Abrasives, we try to stay ahead of the curve. So we came up with Foresight. We call that Foresight. It's a software which is tremendously meant to improve the production throughput. So what it does is, is it provides a real-time monitoring and improved vision for machining, machines and operations. Um, it provides insight into grinding cycle for optimization and troubleshooting. There is no need to install your own IT infrastructure or separate ISP or cellular network. Companies can work with Norton application engineers like Alfredo or me or, or other AEs to provide real-time remote troubleshooting and optimization. Actually, Alfredo just recently conducted a remote test using this technology at one of his customers. So he can talk a little bit more about it and explain it more in detail. Sure, Takwa, happy to do that. Uh, so just to give a quick overview about the system in action. So basically, a current customer that is using this foresight system contacted me about an anomaly that they were dealing in with one of their grinding processes. So I was able to remotely support this customer that is located in Ohio from my office in Massachusetts, which was beautiful. No need to travel there. And it was in real time. So what I did, I virtually accessed to real-time data on their grinders via my laptop. There I was able to see what was going on. So I got a clear snapshot of every single feature that was being ground to this product, which in this case was a uh, tungsten carbide at end mill. After this, I was able to compare, compare the data that I was getting with historical data to help us evaluate key performance indicators. After that, by doing by doing this, we found that the root cause was that somebody tweaked some of the parameters and mm -hmm. that was the main malfunction. So by coming back to the operational parameters that we set up back uh, when we first tested, and this was a test using a paradigm wheel, we were able to bring back the grinder utilization back to a suitable production condition, which in that case was 95% OEE. And I think that this is just the first step. We envision this system to be even able, capable and proactive of alerting and fixing issues before this even happened. So a great system. Yeah, thank you, Alfredo. So you know how we always see that first shift always complains about second shift and third shift and they're going back and forth all the time. This will take care of that because you can see the exact um, changes that anybody makes and they have to plug in why they're making changes. So it really helps with a lot of that, uh, is all of those uh, personnel issues that you would have as well, in addition to all the technological advances and benefits from it. Um, another trend we're seeing is that PCD, which is polycrystalline diamond tools, are kind of being overtaken in certain places by carbon fiber reinforced polymer tools. Mm -hmm. um, reason being, uh, the strength, the durability, and corrosion resistance of CRP, C, CRPF, sorry. Um, it makes it ideal for automotive and aerospace use. 
Um, also, we're seeing that PVD, which is physical vapor deposition coating, is being used in a range of tools nowadays. It's to improve hardness, it provides wear and oxidation resistance. Um, PVD coating is extending the lifespan of the tools, which is very important to the customers of the cutting tool industry. Um, another thing that's important to understand is that a lot of people always want these custom tools. They want tools that are extremely intricate, and it's really expensive to manufacture those, but then we have 3D printing and additive manufacturing these days, which really, really makes it a lot easier. It's a lot cheaper to produce and manufacture those extremely intricate tools. Um, it also reduces the tool's weight, uh, it helps achieve the demanding accuracy, roundness, and surface finish requirements. Um, so data has shown that it reduces milling time and reduced setup times as well. Um, so uh, this is pretty much what we're seeing in the cutting tool market right now moving forward. Um, well, great. Thanks, everybody, for joining us um, this afternoon. I think this was really int insightful, interesting. Um, I learned some uh, a little bit more about the, the industry. Um, and about the new products that we have. I'm excited to be launching some of the new products. Um, so with that, um, again, thank you, everybody. And uh, we look forward to uh, getting back to IMTS in person in 2022. So we had a few years to prep for it, but I'm sure we'll have lots of new products by that <laughs> point. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank, thank you. Jamie. Good job.